Praise the Lord and good evening. This is Pastor Robinson from Harvest Church of Hampton. And you know what it is. Tonight is uh, Harvest at Home Bible Study. We are getting into some good word tonight. I'm looking forward to talking to you today because we've started a new series and the series is called Renovation. Renovation. It is 2022. This is the first Bible study in 2022 and it's going to be a blessing. I do pray that you uh, were with us this past Sunday and that you were able to be in the, in the service, hear the first message on renovation. I will tell you that if you did not hear the first message on renovation this past Sunday, please go look it up on Facebook, on YouTube, on live stream, find it on social media, watch that because it lays the foundation for this teaching on renovation. So grab your Bibles. If you need a cup of tea, grab that. And we're going to get right into it today, if you don't mind. Uh, I do have a great announcement. Now, today, we, we, I'm assigning a new memory verse, okay? The new memory verse today is actually going to come from Philippians, the first chapter, verses 3 through 6. Philippians 1, 3 through 6. This is not our scripture text. I'm just giving you our memory verse, okay? Let me read it to you. I thank God, uh, I'm sorry, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. Let me read the verse four again. Always in every prayer of mine for you, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Verse six, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, I do know that that sounds like a long memory verse verse three through six, but it's really very easy. They're very short uh, verses. Take them two verses a week, okay? Just learn two verses, then add the next two verses on. But you, we have to learn to commit this word into our memory so that the Lord can use us in a mighty way when we don't have our Bible present, all right? Amen. So here's what we're gonna do tonight. I wanna, want to uh, go on into prayer first. If you don't mind, we're going to go before God in prayer. Uh, we're going to lift up those also in prayer who maybe have contracted uh, COVID, uh, this new variant, and or those that are just uh, not doing well in their body and, and something has taken place that is, uh, that's just not right. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you and we give you glory. Thank you for your word and thank you for this Bible study tonight. Thank you for another opportunity to share the gospel. We ask that you would Minister through this word to those that are able to hear it, to those that are watching online and minister to those that are not able to hear it. Heal the sick tonight. Lord, deliver the bound and let this word set us free because you said we shall know the truth and the truth will make us free. We give you glory in Jesus's name. Everybody at home say what? Say amen. Praise the Lord. All right. So I told you Sunday that we started this new series on renovation. And um, like I said, it laid the foundation for the entire series. Uh, be, and it's going to be a blessing to you in the spirit if you go back and you make sure you watch that. But essentially, I, I spoke about the church having gone through or going through a renovation process. We're completed with phase one. There are more phases to come because you should always be growing. You should always be going to higher heights and deeper depths in the spirit, both physically and in the natural. And so um, I, I enumerated how the, the church has been going through a renovation, not just over the last six months, not just with this physical change of our sanctuary, but we've been going through a renovation over the past six years, both physically and spiritually. How many of you know that whether you know it or not, God is always taking you through a renovation, both physically and spiritually. So we recognize that and we talked about how the end of, every res the end of e any renovation is beautiful. It's, it's wonderful. It, it's lovely. I mean, it's something that you just, you know, you have to tear things up. You know, you have to pull out the old, put in the new, pull up carpet, put new paint on. You have to do those things. It's a part of the process. And if you've gone through a, a bathroom renovation, a kitchen renovation, a home renovation, you know, it's a lot of work, right? Can you say amen? And then sometimes you ask yourself, Lord, did I bite off more than I can chew? 
you get in the middle of the project, things are everywhere, but through it all, it may cause some pain, you may have to sweat, it may cause some aggravation, frustration, and it may even raise your blood pressure. But through it all, when you finish, you say, thank you, Jesus, I'm so glad I did it. Why didn't I do it sooner? Amen. But that's just what renovations are like. Uh, they're not always easy. They're not always straightforward. They're not always simple. Sometimes they can be difficult, painful, stressful, and frustrating. Amen. And so uh, what I want to encourage you is, is with, with this. Anyone who's ever been through a renovation process, you know that that's just about how it goes in a nutshell. And, and you know what I'm talking about. So the interesting thing is, we understand renovation, right? But it's odd why it's so difficult for us to process it when we're going through this renovation process with God, right? The Lord is taking us through this, taking us through that. He's taking off the old, putting on the new. It's frustrating. It's, 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 it, sometimes it's painful, but we don't, we, we don't always understand it. We complain but it's what happens. All right. So I want you to know that when you're going through the renovation process, the Lord is looking at your heart. That's what he's looking at. Uh, because your heart represents your motives. Your heart represents your intentions and, and what you do, right? He's looking at what's on the inside, not what's on the outside. That's why you can have something that looks really good on the outside, but it's nothing on the inside and, it, and it's nothing that you'd want to count on. And so God wants to know what makes you tick. He wants to know why you did what you did, not just that you did what you did. I know that's a little, that sounds a little funny, but he, he wants to know your intention. Is that right? And we talked uh, Sunday and we said, hey, there are some areas. Now, these aren't the only areas, but there are some areas that God is concerned about. He's concerned about your relationships. What are you doing there? Are you putting him first? Or are you putting other people first? He's concerned about your finances. Financially, are you putting God first? Or, or are you putting yourself first? And then he's concerned about you emotionally. Uh, are you, is your heart given over to the things of God first? Or are they given over to natural things, you know, selfish things first? God is concerned about that. And uh, he wants to know how you feel about certain things, right? And do you feel the way he feels? And so today, though, what I, I really want to do is I want to go deeper into Philippians, the first chapter and the sixth verse. Amen. I want to talk to you about the heart. I, I want to start with our heart. So we're going to look at several scriptures. Several of them are in the Old Testament as well. So let's get your fingers ready to move. Grab your Bibles, grab your electronic device. Let's get into Philippians, the first chapter. I'm going to read verses one through seven, but we're going to focus on verse six. Let's do it. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now here's verse six. Being confident of this very thing that he which has be, hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in so much, in as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. All right. So the first thing I want to, I want to talk to you about is this. The heart is what counts. That, that's it. The heart is what counts. And that's what I want to show you. You see, when the Spirit is renovating, when the Holy Spirit is renovating your heart, the, his only objective is not, his objective is not to cause pain and discomfort and stress. His objective is to change 
our hearts. That's his objective. And although there may be consequences of this renovation process, although there may be consequences of the things that you have to go through, uh, the objective is just to change your heart because the heart is what matters, you see? And, and because Jesus is looking at the heart, when he met you, he looked at you and he looked at your heart. He, he didn't look at your status. He didn't look at your career position. He didn't look at your political affiliation. He looked at your heart. Let me prove it to you. And let's look at a man named Nathaniel in the New Testament in John, the first chapter. So for time's sake, let me explain this. Nathaniel was one of the 12 disciples, okay? Now, in John the first chapter, the Bible says that John the Baptist had two disciples standing with him, and he sees Jesus go by, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The Bible says that when one of those disciples, whose name was Andrew, when one of those disciples heard Jesus speak the following day, he followed Jesus and became his disciple. But then after he becomes his disciple, Andrew goes and finds his brother named Simon Peter, finds Peter and brings him to Jesus. And then Peter starts following Jesus. Let me show you uh, chapter one, verse 42. And he brought him to Jesus, being Simon. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, thou art Simon the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Now, this isn't the scripture that I wanted to focus on, but let, let me look at this for a second. When Jesus meets Simon Peter, he says to him, I see your heart. He says, I'm going to call you a stone. He said, because I know, I realize, I see that, yes, you're rough around the edges, but you will eventually become loyal. You will be faithful. You will be steadfast. You will be unmovable. And yes, Peter, you're a little stubborn, too. Right. He says, I see your heart. And I, and I just so I wanted to show you that because that's the type of heart Peter had. But the first thing Jesus sees is Peter's heart. Look at verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and he finds Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip says to him, come and see. Listen to me. When your friends, your family, your coworkers, or your enemies doubt that Jesus can change their life, when you tell them you should come visit my church, you should come hear the gospel, and it will change your life. And they say, can it, nothing good can happen in church. Can anything good happen in church? What's the big deal? You simply tell them, come and see. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That's all you have to do. All right. And so verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said to him, whence knowest thou me? How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. In other words, I already knew you. I, I knew you before I met you. Thank you, Jesus. I knew you before I met you. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus meets Nathaniel, what's the first thing Jesus notices about Nathaniel? Does he notice his, um, his political affiliation? No. Does he notice... Uh, Nathaniel's stature or his height? No. Does he notice what Nathaniel's even wearing? No, he does not comment on that. He doesn't comment on Nathaniel's career or on any other external aspect. The first thing Jesus notices or comments on about Nathaniel is his heart. Mm. I want to tell you, Jesus is not concerned. God is not concerned 
primarily about your political affiliation or your status or your financial account or, or any of these other external factors that man is concerned about. Jesus and God are concerned about your what? Your heart, your heart. And let me tell you why. Because your heart speaks to your motives. Mm, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because God doesn't bless your actions. He blesses your motives. He blesses your motives. And, and, and see, G Jesus loved Nathaniel because Nathaniel had the right heart. In other words, Nathaniel had the right motives. There was no guile in Nathaniel. He wasn't trying to deceive Jesus. He simply came to Jesus, even doubting a little bit, right? He says, what good thing can come out of Nazareth? Even doubting, he came to Jesus. Listen, you can come to Jesus even doubting, but because your heart is clean, the Lord will do a great thing for you. And so Nathaniel is an excellent example, an excellent example of and proof that our heart is indicative of our motives. And I would encourage you that when you deal with people, when you work with people, I encourage you to judge them by their heart. Amen. I know that sometimes people don't make the right decisions, but what was their intention? What was their initial motive? Amen. That'll make it so much easier to work with people. And so because the heart is indicative of motive, it takes me to a scripture in the Old Testament about a widow woman of Zarephath. Oh my gosh, I want you to go with me to 1 Kings, the 17th chapter. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. Uh, just to kind of catch you up, just know that in, in the, in the uh, environment at this time, uh, there was a famine. And the Bible says the brook that Elijah was at had dried up, which means there was no rain. So no rain, no food, right? No rain, no food, animals die. It was a problem in the land. So there's this, this famine, and the Bible says that now things are becoming scarce, and Elijah is praying to God, what am I going to do? God says, I want you to go to Zarephath. There's a widow woman there who will sustain thee. Oh, my God. Elijah, in his obedience, gets up, goes to Zarephath, gets to Zarephath, meets this widow woman, and asks her for a morsel of bread. Uh, let me show it to you in first, uh, chapter 17, verse 12, First Kings 17 and 12. And she said, as the Lord liveth, this is what the woman says when Elijah asked her for some food. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but just a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. This would have been the last meal for this woman and her child. And then they were planning on dying. They were in a bad situation. But Elijah, when he met her, he didn't look at her substance. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He, he looked right at her heart because God told Elijah, you're going to meet a woman and she's going to sustain you. He looked at this woman's heart and he saw that this woman had the right heart. So he encourages the woman and he says, listen, he says, if you will bring me a morsel of bread, if you will do as I've said, if you will obey my word, he said, then uh, 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 he says, then the cruise, he said, the bread that you have and the cruise of oil will never fail. In other words, it will never run out. He said it won't run out until God sends rain on the earth. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Remember, there was a famine. So let's see verse 14. It says, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste. This is Elijah speaking. Neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Oh, my God, that's a prophecy of prophecies. Okay. So what did the woman do? The woman obeyed. I told you she had a right heart. She came back. She brought Elijah a little food. And the Bible says she received a miracle. Look at verse 16. And the barrel of meal wasted not. The, all, all the barrel with the cornmeal in it never failed. Every time she would dip some out, 
it would be the same amount left in the barrel. Every time she would make some food, it would be the same amount left in the barrel. How many of you have ever been in a difficult situation and God stretched out what you had? And it seemed like you didn't have enough to make it until the end of the month. But the Lord put his hand on your account. He put his hand on your resources. He put his hand on your cupboards. And miraculously, it stretched until the beginning of the month. Amen. It says the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elisha. I want you to know that this woman of Zarephath had an obedient heart and a heart of obedience is the key to blessing. Yes, it is. If you have an obedient heart, you will receive miracle after miracle after miracle. He will sustain you time and time again, a heart of obedience. He'll cause your cupboards to be running over and you will not lack for anything. You'll have so much that you will have to begin to give things away. I am a living witness that God is able to bless you exceeding and abundantly. Do I have any witnesses out there that God is able to make it so that you have to give things away? Thank you, Jesus. Yes, he does. Yes, he will. All right. So just mark my words. Just believe me. If you've never experienced that, God will make you the lender and not the borrower all the days of your life. You just need an obedient heart. Mm. So having the right heart, it's the most important thing in every area of our life. But it's essentially important when it comes to giving, you see, because we should give. The Lord wants you and I to give with the right heart, with the right mind, with the right motive, whether that's giving um, physical money or whether that's giving of our own substance. Give it with the right heart. In fact, he says, don't give grudgingly. The Lord says, I would rather you not give if you're sorry you gave. If you regret you gave, don't give it. Right. So that's why Jesus applauds this woman in the New Testament. And she's a poor woman. She's a poor woman. You know, you would think that the person who would be most applauded for their giving would be a wealthy person. But Jesus applauds a poor woman, right? Because sometimes the enemy would have us think that it's the amount of the, uh, the it's the amount that the person brings that gives the blessing. Or, or let me say it this way. It's the amount that the person gives that brings the blessing. But that's not true. No, it's not the amount that the person gives, but it's the heart with which the person gives it. Did you hear what I said? It's not the amount you give. It's the heart you give it with. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Let me show it to you. Luke, the 21st chapter, verses one through four, verses one through four. The Bible says, and he looked up. And saw the rich man casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. He sees this. And he said of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast unto the in unto the offerings of God. <clears throat> but she of her punery hath cast in, hath cast it, I'm, scared, I'm sorry, but she of her punery hath cast in all the living that she hath. Punery means her poverty. She gave out of poverty. And Jesus says she put in everything that she had. This is all she had to live on. And so I wanted to give you this account because I wanted to show you that God knows from the start the motive of your heart when you do something. He already knows. He does. He knows this. And so as we're looking in the book, uh, uh, in the book of Luke, you see that this woman was poor and she gave all that she had. But then the, the wealthy person gave, but they gave out of their abundance. So it wasn't, it wasn't as much of a sacrifice. Notice Jesus doesn't discount the giving of the wealthy person. He does not. He simply says that the poor woman has given more in the spirit than the wealthy person because she gave of her, uh, out of her poverty. Excuse me. Now, 
Uh, uh, let me show you something over here. Uh, I, want, I, I want you to see that uh, God already knows the motive of your heart, okay? I want to take you to 1 Kings, the third chapter. 1 Kings, in the first book of Kings, the third chapter, the Bible, it records the story of two harlots, two prostitutes that lived together in the same house. Well, not only did they live together in the same house, but both of these women became pregnant at the same time. Both women had a child within three months of each other. Now, one night, one of the women was sleeping and she rolled over onto her child and smothered it and the child died. That same night, that woman gets up, exchanges her baby with the living baby and takes the living baby as her own. Needless to say, the mother who had the living baby recognized that this baby that she had was not her child. So now where I'm going to bring you is now we're standing before King Solomon because, of course, this has to go before the king. Now we're standing before King Solomon. Both women are, are, are arguing their point and position, and they're both claiming that this baby belongs to them. This living baby belongs to them. King Solomon has to make a decision about what's going to happen. How am I going to resolve this matter? Remember what I'm telling you. God knows the heart and the motive from the beginning. And, and so I want you to consider how wicked a person would have to be to try to take the life of another woman's living baby. It's not enough that she lost her baby, but now she wants to take the life of another woman's baby. That's another Bible study for another time, but just consider that, all right? So after much debating, Solomon has to make a decision. And Solomon decides, okay, what we'll do is we'll cut the baby in half. One half will go to one woman, one half will go to the other woman, and that will decide the matter. Well, when the sentence is passed down, you can imagine, you know, what was said. And here's, I want you to listen to the responses of both mothers, okay? One woman has an honest heart. The other woman has a wicked heart. 1 Kings 3 and 26 and 27. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king. This is the woman who it really was her baby. For her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, oh, my Lord, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. But the other woman said, let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. She said, cut the baby in half. Man, that's, that's, that's wicked. Then the king answered and said, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. See, God knew the motive of those women's heart. And when Solomon came down with that decision, the Lord knew that the woman with the right motive would never want her baby to die. So Solomon and God knew that, that whichever woman said, let the baby live, just give the baby to the other woman. He knew that that was the right woman. That woman had a right motive. She had a right heart. God already knows your heart. All right. And so, so the true question is this, since the Lord is looking at your heart, the true question is not what you do but it's why you do what you do. It's not what we do. It's why we do what we do, right? It's, it's why did we give an offering? Did we give an offering so that we could look good in front of others? Did we give an offering so that we could compete with the Joneses? Did we give an offering because it was the expected thing to do? Or did we give an offering because the Lord laid it on our heart and we didn't even want anybody to know it was us that gave it? Why do we do what we do? Why did we make the contribution, right? Why did we help that person? Did we help that person so that we could get a pat on the back so that they could make a big deal out of us uh, in public? Why did we compliment that person? 
Did we compliment them so that they would compliment us back? Oh, those are some nice shoes you have on. Now you're expecting them to compliment you back on what you have on. That's the wrong motive. Why did you tell that person your name? Oh, oh let me explain. Sometimes uh, when you do something for somebody or when something happens, we will tell a person our name. But sometimes people will tell you their name because they want uh, recognition. They want you to know. They want you to go tell somebody else what they did. But then other people do what they do anonymously. Why did you tell that person your name? Why did you tell them what um, school you attended? Why did you tell them what type of car that you drive, right? What's the motive? What's the heart behind all of that? Why did you tell them what you do for a living? Did it really make a difference in the conversation or did you just want them to be impressed with what you do? Why did you invite them to church? Did you invite them to church because you want them to come to Jesus? You want their life to change for the better? Or did you invite them to church so that you could be recognized in church because you were the one that invited them? Oh, good you, good you. I, I understand. So, so the question is not what, you, what did you do? The question is, why did you do what you did? And even if we do something wrong, it's better to have the right intentions. Think about that. Yeah, because it's easier to forgive someone who who has the right intentions and does the wrong thing as opposed to forgiving someone who has the wrong intentions and does the wrong thing. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. You're willing to forgive a child who has the right intentions. They they just wanted to make you breakfast, but they happened to spill all of the milk across the floor. But they were trying to make you breakfast. They had the right intentions. It's easy to forgive that, right? So, so it's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. It starts with your heart because your heart determines how you're going to respond to God. Amen. And when you're going through this renovation process, it may feel like chastening. It may feel difficult. It may feel uncomfortable, but your heart determines how you will respond to the father. Will you respond in obedience? Will you respond with or in humility? How will you respond? The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. All right. Listen, let's summarize what we talked about in this Bible study today in our series on renovation. First of all, we said that you know God is taking you through a renovation. He, he's taking you through a physical renovation and he's taking you through a spiritual renovation. Renovations are not always easy. They're not simple. They're not always straightforward. Sometimes they can be painful. Sometimes they can be difficult, sometimes they can be stressful, and sometimes frustrating. But you have to know that the reason the Lord is taking you through it is because he's concerned about your heart. God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. And then uh, we learned that there, you know, there are many areas, but he wants to look at our relationships and he wants to find out, hey, are you putting me first in your relationships? He wants to look at our financial position financially. He wants to know, are you putting me first concerning your finances, right? Do you give to me first or do you give to the world first or do you give to yourself first? Then he wants to find out emotionally, how do we feel? Do we put God's feelings first when it comes to a matter, right? Do we, are we more concerned with what God thinks than what we think or how we feel, all right? Then we talked about Nathaniel because Jesus wasn't concerned with Nathaniel's position, his career, his political affiliation or any other factor. Jesus was concerned about Nathaniel's heart. And he said, Nathaniel, I'm looking at you and you are a man and there's no guile in your heart. You're a good man. Amen. Then we talked about the necessity to have a heart of obedience. We looked at the woman of Zarephath and how Elijah asked this woman to make him a meal when she only had enough for one little meal for her and her son, and then they would die. But the woman was obedient. We talked about having a heart of obe how having the heart of obedience will bring a blessing every time. Amen. And this woman's cruise of oil never failed. Neither did the bread fail. Amen. And last but not least, we talked about the heart of a poor woman. And, and how she gave out of her poverty and how 
Jesus saw her giving as much greater and more valuable than the giving of a particular wealthy person in the account. He didn't discount the giving of the wealthy person, but he said that the poor woman has given more because she gave her last. She gave what she had to live on. Amen. So we know that intention makes a difference when it comes to the heart, right? It speaks to motive. Motive means intention. And we said it's, it's always easier to forgive somebody who has the right intention and does the wrong thing than someone who has the wrong intention and does the wrong thing. Amen? Always easier. So I hope today that you uh, learn something. I hope that you're able to see what God's purpose is and what his priority is. In the coming weeks, we're going to be uh, breaking this down further and further in our series on intention. I'm sorry, in our series on renovation. But let me pray for you tonight. I want to pray that God blesses you and gives you the right heart. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We give you glory tonight for your word. Thank you for taking us through this series on renovation. Thank you for giving us the mind to parallel that which is that which has been going on in our physical life with what's going on in our spiritual life. Lord, we know that there are things about us that have to change. We know that you're tearing some things out and that you're putting some new things in. You said in your word that if any man believes on you, he is a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away and behold, all things should become new. Help to make us new today in the name of Jesus. Lord, give us a a, an honest heart. Give us an obedient heart. Let us not be stressed out by the, the, the cares of this life, but help us to know that you're simply changing our hearts. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, let us have the right intentions and the right motive and the right motives when it comes to following your will. Today we vow to give you honor and glory. We vow to give you praise. Bless your people, Lord. Bless every hearer today. Pour out your spirit and keep us in this environment and help us to live holy and live saved. In Jesus' name, we say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I want to thank you for joining us tonight at Harvest at Home. I do look forward to you uh, being with us again this coming Sunday at 11 a.m. in-person worship service. We will have 9.30 a.m. Christian education, which will be online But you can come in person if you'd like. That's always a great blessing. But we're going to have great word and great worship this Sunday at 11 a.m. Please join us. You will be blessed. I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. Have a great night.